Stay tuned for all the excitement of the world champion Cincinnati Reds. Reds Radio is produced solely by the broadcast department of the Cincinnati Reds Incorporated, Jim Winters, director. Now we invite you to listen to Main Spark with Reds manager Sparky Anderson and Marty Brenneman. And Turfside, hosted by Joe Nuxall. about the high cost of heating your home? Switch your oil or gas heating system to a Carrier electric heat pump. It heats your home for less than half the cost of electrical resistance systems. It can also cool your home in summer. Save money. Call Carrier. you got to play. into Schmidt Heating and Cooling, 4224 Montgomery Road. accommodating Grange agent to tell you about his extraordinary life insurance. He can tailor the right kind of coverage for the young bachelor, a career girl, the young married, and for those who put off investing in life insurance. What you need is what you get from Grange. This is the main spark with manager Sparky Anderson and Marty Brenneman. Brought to you by your Greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Chrysler Plymouth dealers. The men who like to say yes. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Riverfront Stadium. The Reds against the New York Mets in the final game of the two-game series with a couple of left-handers going tonight. Freddie Norman for Cincinnati and 10-game winner John Matlack for New York. Last night, the Mets broke the Reds' four-game winning streak behind left-hander Jerry Kuzman, a 2-1 to -one final. And Spark, did you see it, the game last night, as one of the best pitch games against us this season? I thought it was the best pitch game. We've been shut out, you know, and there's been some other, you know, real fine ball games pitched against us. But I don't think we've had a game where you didn't feel like somewhere along the line you're going to get a shot at him. Uh, I'll be truthful, last night after about the fourth, I never thought we were going to get a shot. The only thing I told Teddy is if we can get somebody on and somebody happens to hit one, that's going to be our shot, Ted. But I, I don't see us mounting any attack as far as a base hit and maybe another base hit and then an out and a base hit. I couldn't see anything like that because last night he just had super stuff. Against a pitcher like him, pitching like he did, that's about the only thing you can hope for, isn't it, a long ball? Yeah, you can hope that uh, maybe somebody boots a ball or you get a, a flare somewhere and then somebody jolts one real quick and, and you get ahead three to two and then you hold on. But you're not going to mount any rallies when a guy is pitching like that, Marty, and making the good pitches that he was making. He It didn't bother him at any time to be behind anybody. If he was ahead of him, he finished him off. If he was behind him, he was patient enough that he waited to make his pitch. He didn't look like that, you know, at any time. 
time. He wasn't going to let certain guys beat him. You could see that. He was pitching around them. If they wanted to help him out, fine. But he was not going to challenge and go to them. The thing, I guess, that most impressed me about his pitching last night was the fact that he was not afraid to throw that curveball in any situation and got it over. Any situation. And he didn't care when it was. 3-1, 2-0, 3-2. And not only that, he was establishing that he was quick enough last night that don't be going out there looking for it because if you do, you get that fastball in on you, you might get yourself hurt. Spark, you can't go up there looking for anything special when a man is pitching like that, can you? The only thing I told David last night, go up, go up and set out a fastball because he sure the heck wasn't going to hit that other one the way he was throwing it last night. David went up there the one time. He looked over after two in a row, two curveballs, as if to say to me, well, what do I do now? And the third one, he gave him another one, and he just walked away. I said, well, David, one thing about those new bats you just got, you haven't had a chance to try them out yet. Spark Kuzman has a reputation for being a cold-weather pitcher. He admitted as much to after the game. Were you looking for him to possibly weaken in the late inning? Well, that's what I thought before the game. You know, I know Jerry does like to pitch in cold weather. He doesn't particularly like real hot weather. He's always said that himself. And I thought, you know, as the game goes along, we'll get him. But after the fourth, I noticed the heat either wasn't hot enough or he didn't buy the heat last night. We'll be back with more after we pause for this message. Cordova. Now, more than ever, you will find it a most thoughtful automobile. Now you can order Cordoba with a revolutionary new engine. An engine that thinks computer control to react within a thousandth of a second. To fire with precision. To burn cleanly and evenly. To run so very smoothly and accelerate responsibly. It is ingenious, an engine with a computer which monitors six separate engine conditions, an engine which burns leaded or unleaded fuel, yet needs no catalytic converter. This is the marvel of Chrysler's amazing new lean burn engine, available now in Cordoba. Get your clearance price on Cordoba at Westwood Chrysler Plymouth, 6186 Glenway Avenue, Cincinnati. Spark, an unfortunate game, uh, I guess one of many this season for Gary Nolan. Gary's pitched super. You know, I was at the Insiders today, and somebody asked me, you know, how come Gary Nolan never seems to get no runs? I said, there's only two things he ever gets. He either gets rain or no runs. One of the two. Gary has pitched uh, over the years, you know, other than the years that he was hurt and didn't pitch, but he's pitched super here, and it seems like that every ball game, some way or another, he either hooks up with the outstanding pitcher, or that night, we just don't seem to score runs. I don't know why. I have no answer for it, but a ball game like he pitched last night, you don't have to be ashamed. To anything. Was he getting his stuff up in the first inning? First inning, he wasn't sharp last night. You know, his control wasn't sharp. And he was had a little stiffness in his neck last night, and he was kind of fighting that a little bit early. And then as that started to loosen up, I knew after the first inning, when he went out in the second, I told Teddy, I said, that's it. They won't score no more. Now it's a matter of can we score. And I felt as the first inning, especially Pete hits the first ball out, I said, oh, well, we'll get three or four tonight. But we didn't. <laughs> Spark, why have you held Ken Griffey out for the last couple of nights? Well, Kenny had a, his shoulder was bothering him, it still is some, um, but he had a little, uh, he wasn't feeling too good in the plane ride coming home from, the day I put him in the pinch run the last day in Pittsburgh, he had, had a little problem, uh, not feeling real well, he went in, and when he come in, he was a little dizzy, it wasn't anything serious, he just, his stomach was a little upset, and coming back on the plane, so I just gave him yesterday off, he's playing today. Everything is okay, though, physically. I mean, there's nothing to be concerned about in his case. No, no, no problems. Just that, you know, just not, might have had a little touch of the flu. I, we don't know what it was, but it was just not feeling good for two days. Are you pleased with the overall physical situation on your club right now? Yeah, we're pleased as far as being this long into the season. And, uh, you know, it's tough. We've played 92 ball games. Of course, after that, you've taken a little beating. I don't care who you are. Even a manager's stomach takes a little beat. <laughs> but, uh, really, we're in good physical shape in comparison to everybody else. I don't think that we have any excuses that way or anything like that. It's just time to get ready and get going, though. We'll be back to wrap it up after we pause again for this. Hello, everybody. This is Jamboree J. Jones. The J stands for Jackets. And at Jamboree Sporting Goods Stores, we stand for only the finest quality jackets. Jackets of every size, jackets of every color, and a super selection of styles, including both jacket and coat. Your choice of collar styles, body and leather colors, too. Even a choice of colors for the snaps. Choose from handsome knit combinations with knit cuffs and waistbands. At Jamboree Sporting Goods, we do all of our own lettering and embroidery, so that your jacket is ready to wear in just days. 
If you haven't already ordered your school routine jacket, don't wait any longer. Fall will be here before you know it. And right now, Jamboree Sporting Goods stores are just bursting at the seams with jackets, jackets, and more jackets. Each and every one, first quality, a size, style, and color for every man, woman, and child. Jamboree Sporting Goods stores are located at 11528 Springfield Pike near Kemper, 205 Main Street, Milford, 2107 Ferguson Road in Western Hills, and the Wilmington Plaza Shopping Center. Also at Liberty, Indiana. Spark, you know, this has been a, a strange season in more ways than one for us. One big surprise to me has been the fact that, uh, well, we've been a much better road club this season than we have at home. Which is crazy. You know, last year we were a great home club, and I always feel a lot better playing at home. I don't know what it is or why, but I don't know. I just feel when we're home, we're a real good ball club. And on the road, you're always a little skeptical because anything can happen, especially on long road trips, guys get tired of being away and you you know the food and everything and you like to be home playing but we have not played that way at home i'm hoping we'll finish because we got two good home stands yet at home if we can really have good you know good times then we're going to be all right can you remember playing this well on the road before yeah we had the uh, year before last uh we had a great great road record crime and in fact guys used to say let's get on the road where we can win but uh, last year, we, as I've always felt, that our club is, is molded for this ballpark. And I really felt that, you know, we'd have another big year this year and here, and, and we just haven't to this point, but we will. Okay, the second and final game of this series against the New York Mets before the Reds go back out on the road for a four-game weekend series in Atlanta. Freddie Norman after his eighth victory for Cincinnati tonight against New York Met left-hander John Matlack. And now on most of these same Reds baseball network stations, stay tuned for Joe Nuxall with a turf side show. This has been the Main Spark with manager Sparky Anderson and Marty Brenneman. Brought to you by Jamboree Sporting Goods, headquarters for all athletic and school jackets. Time is money, and vacation time in the USA means spending lots of both, unless you're visiting Firestone. Spending less time and less money so you can enjoy traveling more is what Firestone means. That's why they decided to reduce all prices on their famous Deluxe Champion Super Belt, the long mileage 76 new car tire, which flexes two fiberglass belts on its polyester cord body. Quality craftsmanship you can now have for $10.20 to $16.55 off the regular June prices, or as little as $25 each for an A78 13-size black wall, plus $1.75 federal excise tax exchange. Good timing and great pricing for the budget-minded vacation planner especially. Even the larger size super belts cost under $45. And if you prefer white walls, just add $3.25 to $4.25 each. We said less money and less time, too, because the folks at Brogan Oil, 4210 Glenway and Price Hill, mount your new tires fast and absolutely free. So before taking that trip, visit your friends at Brogan Oil, where time is money well spent. Time now for Turfside with Joe Nuxall. Brought to you by International Trucks, makers of Scout 2, the all-purpose vehicle that works hard and plays hard. Hi, everybody. Tonight, the Reds and the Mets wind up the short two-game series here at Riverfront Stadium. Two left-handers will go to the mound for New York. It'll be John Matlack for the Reds' Freddie Norman. Our guest on Turfside, the pitching coach of the New York Mets, Rube Walker, and we're going to be back and compare the New York Mets' uh, current pitching staff to a great one that Rube was a part of, received, I should say, for the old Brooklyn Dodgers. And we'll be back with that conversation after this word. Over-the-road trucking is a tough business, but international trucks are built to help you make it in a tough business. Take International's Transtar 2, the heavy-duty cab-over vehicle that's all muscle, no flag. International designed Transtar 2 to be as dependable as your right arm. It's engineered for greater durability and safety. A dual brake system is standard. So is the 100,000-mile air cleaning system that makes servicing much less of a problem, downtime less prolonged. And International's Transtar Sports Single Wall Cab Construction. This trims the chassis of excess weight, makes for easier repair. International also thought about your personal comfort. That's why you can get Transtar with an 8-track tape deck and the driver's area doubles as a berth. So if you want to make it in a tough business, Transtar 2 is the one to run with. Might be the only partner you'll ever need. See it at your nearby international dealer. 1200 Guest Street, Queensgate, Cincinnati, and off I-275 between 71 and 75, Cincinnati. Walker, I guess, tonight. And, Rube, uh, you look at the pitching staff of the New York Mets, uh, the Tom Seaver, uh, Jerry Kuzman, John Matlack, and so on down the line. You look back to the great staff that uh, you were able to receive uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. How do you compare them? 
Well, they're both real strong pitching staffs. They both of them are power uh, pitchers. All of them are power pitchers. And uh, it's kind of hard to compare the two staffs because I feel like that uh, the staff we have now, these uh, our five starters, are as strong as any pitching in, uh, that I've been around or, or I've seen. Rube, uh, the D Dodgers staff, is there any particular pitcher will, first of all, take Tom Seaver? What pitcher on the old Brooklyn staff might you compare to? Well, I don't, we didn't have one that would compare with Tom uh, as far as uh, Tom's stuff. Now, Newcomb was a hard thrower, had uh, the great arm, great fastball, but he didn't have the curve uh, that uh, Seaver's got. And I don't think that, uh, you know, well, that, but this way, I don't be, it would be, be hard to compare the two guys. But as far as uh, the control part of it, they both was basically good control pitchers. Uh, Newcomb pitched 300 innings and walked 40 men a year, which I thought was fantastic. In that old ballpark. Especially in that ballpark is right, because you'd like to walk a lot of those guys that you couldn't walk. Rube, you, you look at that Brooklyn pitching staff, and uh, if I remember correctly, preacher roll. Well, uh, the left-handed pitching on the Mets uh, about, the, what, uh, two yards quicker than old Preach. Well, yes, they had, they got a, well, now, they tell me when Preacher first come up, he had a, a real good fastball. I didn't get to see Preacher when he broke in. I can't think that was with the old St. Louis Cardinals, and uh, they said Preacher could throw hard then, too, but I never did get to see him when he could throw hard. What's the story about his spitball? I've heard a lot of things, and uh, I heard the story Pee Wee Reese told it about how Preacher Rowe would get his spitball. Well, there was a lot of ways that Preacher got it, but he would never let nobody know how he got it. He wouldn't even let the catchers know that uh, how he got it or when he was going to throw it. Uh, he, we'd just have to be looking for it all the time, be ready to catch it, just uh, catching off the fastballs all we was done, Campy and I. Did you ever find out how he got it? I never did find out how he got it. He never would tell nobody, but there's a lot of people said that they did know how he got it, but I doubt it. The preacher never did say that's the way he did. He wouldn't give nobody the satisfaction of, uh, of you know, uh, saying that they didn't know how he got it. Rube, is there anybody uh, that you suspicion throwing a spitball in our league today? Well, there's a lot of times you see some of those pitches come up there that uh, they got to be uh, wet or there's something on them because there's some of them that uh, dip pretty quick and act a little funny, Joe. So, I, yes, I think there's a guys that are like now throwing it. Do you think it's a pitch that uh, should be legalized or not? As far as I'm concerned, it should be legalized because... Uh, Everybody can throw it, and they can't get it over. They're still throwing it, and it's uh, it's just another pitch. Yeah, I'd say legalize the thing. Talk about his uh, spitball, Preacher Rose spitball. Did he have uh, good control of it? Could he throw it to spots? Well, Preacher had good control of everything he threw, but his uh, his spitter was uh, the ball that uh, he called his screwball. It broke down most of the time, and it wasn't that tough to catch. And he had good control of it. He he get the ball over. He he throw it. Uh, the three and two, and you know you got to have good control then. Let's go to the bullpen and the uh, Dodger, that particular area, uh, era, a guy by the name of Clem Labine, and you, right now you have a young man by the name of Skip Lockwood. Well, Clem Labine was a fine relief pitcher. He had a real good sinker and a good curve, and Clem, had, uh, Clem could go to the post every day like Skip can, and Skip, uh, he, is, he throws much harder than Clem threw, but he has a good breaking ball too. His curve is good. But Labine had the good sinker, and they well, they're both just fine uh, bullpen pitchers, great relief pitchers. Left-handed pitching, other than uh, than uh, uh, Preacher Rowe, there wasn't much uh, on the Dodgers staff that I recall. Well, we had to, had Carl Spooner, you know, for a year there that uh, I thought was going to be one of the all-time great pitchers, and with the delivery he had, how you hurt his arm, Joe, is still a mystery to all of us. We can't still don't believe that uh, Spooner hurt his arm though, with the delivery he had and uh, he sure had a great fight. His fastball was his, uh, well you compare his fastball with the Koufax and people like that. How about comparing him to Jerry Kuzman, probably more to uh, John Matlack probably? Well yes, now, now Kuzi is, uh, people don't realize this, maybe they, they will sooner or later, but Kuzman's fastball is getting better now in the last, uh, well this year is much better than it was last year. And, you know, he hurt his arm a few years ago and uh, it took a while for it to come back and get the, the velocity that he had before. But he's almost back to what he was when he first come up. You talk about a guy like Jerry Kuzman and, and, and this is what you see. Is it just a mere fact that his arm is finally regaining strength after an arm injury? Well, uh, Joe, I would have to say that. that his arm is uh, regaining the strength that he had in the, in the arm before that he hurt the, uh, the shoulder or whatever injury it was, whatever part of it is in the back and in the shoulder. I don't think it ever really knew what it was, really was. 
The Dodger pitching staff in those years, uh, Rube, uh, to you, who was the best pitcher on the staff? Well, I would have to say that for the stuff, for the Carl Erskine in 1952 had as good a stuff as uh, anybody I ever saw. He was the best pitcher I ever caught uh, that year. He had uh, the great fastball, a good curve, and the changeup that was just unbelievable. We always said it stopped and then came onto the plate. It sure looked like it backed up at times, Joe. <laughs> Rube, uh, where time's gone, we thank you for chatting with us. Very interesting. Thank you, Joe. All right. Rube Walker, the pitching coach of the New York Mets, will be back with a look at the starting pitchers after this word. Today in southwest Ohio, the time you spend in a hospital bed receiving necessary care costs an average of $157 a day. But thanks to advances in medical science, certain tests and treatments previously paid for on an inpatient basis are now paid for on a less costly outpatient basis. Services such as diagnostic x-rays, EEGs, EKGs, organ scans, lab examinations, and emergency care are all available as options to basic Blue Cross and Blue Shield coverage. Check to see if your Blue Cross and Blue Shield coverage includes these benefits. And next time your physician advises tests or treatment, ask about pre-admission testing, same-day surgery, Verticare, and reduced stay. Take advantage of these outpatient programs to help prevent or reduce lengthy and costly hospital and medical care. Together, we can help hold down the rate of increase in health care costs. Well, the Reds and the Mets close out this short two-game homestand here tonight, and there'll be two left-handers going to the mound for New York, John Matlock for the Reds, Fred Norman. Madlock will be making his 21st start of the year with 11 complete games and a 266 earned run average. He's won 10 and lost 3 in 152 innings, has allowed 127 hits, has struck out 85, has walked 35. This will be Madlock's third start against the Reds this year. He was not involved in the decision. A 2 to nothing win for the Reds in 11 innings on May the 5th in that particular game. He allowed six hits and no runs in nine and two-thirds innings and was forced to leave the game because of a cramp in his left hand. Beat the Reds 7-5 to five on May the 16th, giving up nine hits, including a home run by Pete Rose and five runs all of them earned. Lifetime against Cincinnati is 1-3 and lost eight. Freddie Norman in his 11th start of the year with four complete games and a 289 earned run average. Fred has won seven and lost two in 84 innings. He has allowed 68 hits, striking out 58 and walking 38. This will be Fred's second start and third appearance against New York this year. He lost 5-3 to three in decision to Tom Seaver on May the 4th, giving up two runs, five walks, and no hits in two innings. Fred was not involved in the decision. A 7-5 to five New York win on May 16th, allowing one hit, no runs, and three innings of relief. Lifetime against New York. Fred has won three and has lost four. So those are your starters. John Matlock, 10-3. and three. Fred Norman, 7-2. and two. Stay tuned. We'll be back with Play by Play in just a couple of minutes. You've just heard Turfside with Joe Nuxall. Brought to you by Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Southwest Ohio. Saving health care dollars is everyone's responsibility. Hello, Gene Lehman, Riverside Ford. Great news for economy-minded small car buyers. 1976 Pinto sales at Riverside Ford have been tremendous. We've probably sold more Pintos than a Ford dealer in the Midwest. How can we do it? Because we give you the $200 down payment for a new 1976 Pinto Pony. A brand new 1976 Pinto Pony equipped with a four-speed transmission and white wall tires. The sales price is $3,056. We give you our check for $200 for a down payment. Leaves a balance of $2,856 to be financed. Finance charges are only $828, making your total amount of payments $3,684 at an annual percentage rate of only 13.09. For 48 months, you will pay only $76.75 a month. That's right. For only $76.75 a month, you can own a brand new 1976 Pinto Pony from Riverside Ford in Newport, Kentucky. WLW Cincinnati. You can't lose when you buy a 95-inch electric riding mower at International Harvester. After 30 days, you get $100 or your money back, if not completely satisfied. The world champion Cincinnati Reds are on the air. It's the Reds on Radio with Marty Brenneman and Joe Nuxall. 
Fred Baseball is brought to you by the Stroh Brewery Company, family brewers for more than 200 years. And by Marathon Oil Company, people who make their living doing the best they can. By the Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company of Cincinnati, bottlers of Pepsi-Cola, Dr. Pepper, and Schweppes products. By Frisch's at breakfast time, lunch time, or any time you're hungry, there's always a Frisch's nearby. By the First National Bank of Cincinnati, a good place to put your money and your confidence. And by Riverside Ford in Newport, a block and a bridge from downtown Cincinnati. Now, for all the play-by-play -play action of Cincinnati Reds baseball, we go to Marty Brenneman and Joe Nuxall. Good evening, everybody, from Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. Joe Nuxall and yours truly, Marty Brenneman, welcoming you to Reds baseball. Final game of the two-game set against Joe Frazier's Mets tonight, and a couple of left-handers going, Freddie Norman against John Matlack. We'll be back to take a look at the starting lineups in just a moment. I'm Conway Twitty. And I'd like to tell you something. This land's been good to me. Oh, it's good to see how some things have stood the test of time. Like folks who love their fellow man, take pride in working with their hands. Pride in carrying on the family name. They expect the same. Some things should never change like the hot corn bread that your mama made. A young folks splashing in a swimming hole For the satisfaction that you get seen Feels you planted grow As you end the good day with The great taste of Stroh's beer For more than 200 years The great taste of Stroh's Conway Twitty for the Stroh Brewery Company, Detroit, Michigan. Starting lineups for the New York Mets, leading off and playing center field. Just picked up in a deal with the Montreal Expos last night, Pepe Mangual. Batting second and playing second base, Felix Mion. John Milner will be in left field, batting third. Hitting fourth at first base, Joe Torrey. Mike Vale will be in right field, batting number five. Hitting sixth and doing the catching, Jerry Grody. Roy Steger at third base will bat seventh. Hitting eighth at shortstop, Bud Harrelson. And hitting ninth and pitching for the Mets, left-hander John Matlack. Again for New York, it's Mangual in center, Mion at second base, Milner in left field. Torrey at first, Bale in right, Grody catching. Steger at third, Harrelson at shortstop, and Matlack on the mound. For Cincinnati, Pete Rose will lead off and play third base. Hitting second in right field, Ken Griffey. Joe Morgan will play second and bat third. The cleanup batter, left fielder George Foster. Johnny Bench, doing the catching, will hit fifth. Batting sixth and playing first base, Tony Perez. Davey Concepcion at shortstop will bat seventh. In the eighth spot, in center field, Cesar Geronimo. And hitting ninth and pitching is left-hander Fred Norman. Again, going over the Reds' batting order, it's Rose at third, Griffey in right field, and Morgan at second base. Foster in left. Bench catching, Perez at first base. With Concepcion at shortstop, Geronimo in center field, and Norman pitching. This broadcast is authorized and a broadcasting rights granted by Cincinnati Reds Incorporated solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. Any publication, rebroadcast, or other use of the descriptions and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Cincinnati Reds Incorporated is prohibited. The announcers on this broadcast are employed by the Cincinnati Reds Incorporated. Joe, a couple of left-handers going tonight, and I guess if we have one consoling influence before we start play is that there is no way we would think John Matlack could pitch a better game than Jerry Kuzman did. I'd have to say it'd be very difficult because Jerry certainly did uh, crank up a gem last night. And, uh, of course, Matlack's capable of pitching the same ball game. He can't take it away, but Freddie Norman also is capable of pitching a good ball game uh, similar to Kuzman. So if both of them are right, we could see another excellent and well-pitched ball game. We're ready to go as Pepe Mangual leads it off. He chops one out in front of the mound. Up with the ball, Norman barehanded, throwing him out to Tony Perez at first base, and this game is underway. 
Pepe Mangual picked up last night in a two-for-two two swap with the Montreal Expos. Wayne Garrett and Del Unce are going to Montreal in return for this man who just tapped out to Norman Mangual and reserve outfielder Jim Dwyer. So with one pitch, Norman has recorded an out and he'll go to work on the Mets second baseman Felix Mion. It was a dandy last night. The Mets scored two in the first. We got the home run from Rose in the bottom of the inning, and that was the extent of the scoring as the Mets won behind Kuzman 2-1. to one. Outside a ball to the right-handed batting second baseman Mion. Norman, after his eighth victory, he's lost but twice and has a fine 289 earned run average. He's facing Mion, who steps in at 259 with a homer and 14 runs batted in. Here's a pitch to the plate, swung on a bouncing ball by the mound. Concepcion gobbles it up and throws him out. Two away. Left fielder John Milner will be the two-out batter here. Milner hitting at a 276 average with 10 home runs. He's driven across 45. Well, we need a win tonight to remain six up in front of the Dodgers. They moved two within six last night with a 3-2 victory behind Doug Rowell for the Cardinals, and they won this afternoon in 10, 7-6. Fastball is high and tight, ball one. Perez, Morgan, Concepcion, and Rose make up the Reds infield defensively. Foster, Geronimo, Griffey, left, center, and right, and, Ger and bench behind the plate. Check swing by Milner. It's two balls and no strikes. On deck is first baseman Joe Torre. Mangual has bounced back to the mound, and Mian has been thrown out by Concepcion. Here is a pop that will be out of play, dropping into the seats behind the Cincinnati dugout. Two balls and a strike on John Milner. This is the second start of the year and the third appearance for Norman against New York. He lost a 5-3 decision to Tom Seaver on May 4th, one of only two losses he suffered all year. Swung out and fouled. And the left-handed batting met outfielder is even against the Reds' left-hander Norman at 2-2. Two two. Dick Stello, our plate umpire. Jim Quick is at first base. Billy Williams umpiring at second. And Harry Windelstadt over at third. Norman trying to knock him off 1-2-3 in the first inning. Left-hander looking back into Johnny Bench for the sign. And he comes to the plate with a 2-2 offering. That is strike three call. A fastball that cut the inside corner and the side is out. The Mets are down 1-2-3. And after a half inning of baseball, New York nothing. And the Reds are coming to bat. There's a feeling around. It's America's sound. Pepsi people feeling free. Free to choose a new way. Free to stand up and say, you be you. Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company of Cincinnati is pleased to announce the Cincinnati Reds 1975 World Champions commemorative bottle free with the purchase of a six-bottle carton of 32-ounce Pepsi-Cola. For a limited time, when you purchase a six-bottle carton of 32-ounce Pepsi-Cola, you receive free a 16-ounce Cincinnati Reds 1975 World Champions commemorative bottle. Five-cent deposit required on each bottle. Join the Pepsi people. Pepsi yours today at participating dealers. 26-year-old left-hander John Madlack on for the Mets as we move on to the bottom of the first inning, and this young man may well be on his way to his best year ever in a New York Met uniform. Top season win-wise was 1975 when he rang up 16 victories, and already this year has won 10 and lost only three with a 266 ERA. Madlack will be making his 21st start. He has 11 complete games, and is 1-0 against Cincinnati this season and won no decision. He beat a 7-5 with a complete game here on the 16th of May, giving up nine hits and five runs while not gaining a decision in a 2-0 11-inning Reds victory on the 5th of May in Shea Stadium. It'll be Pete Rose to start it off as usual. He opened the game with a bang last night with an opposite field home run on Kuzman's first pitch, his seventh of the year. Here's Madlock's pitch to him, and Rose bounces one over the head of Steger, fielded by Harrelson, and will not even attempt to throw. And in 
infield hit by Rose on a high chop over the head of third baseman Roy Steger. Harrelson came up in the hole at shortstop, but he elected to hang on to the ball. Well, let's hope that leads to better things than last night. He let off the game with a home run last night, and that was it. So maybe uh, this will mean we'll get a few, as the boys say, scores tonight. We need it to gain a split in this two-game series. And with Rose at first base, here's Ken Griffey returning to the lineup after a two-game absence. Kenny hitting 330. Matlack checking Rose at first base and comes to the plate. Griffey takes it outside a ball. They've got Torrey at first base with Mian at second, Harrelson short, rookie Roy Steger at third. John Milner is in left field, Pepe Mangual is in center, and Mike Vale in right. Brody behind the plate, hangs a sign for Matlack. His 1-0 pitch to Griffey, that is taken off the plate, and high ball two, two and nothing. Well, we pointed it out so many times when you're facing the quality pitchers in the National League, the Matlacks, the Kuzmans, the Seavers, people of this nature. You hope you can get them early because more often than not, they seem to really gain momentum and effectiveness as the game progresses. Matlack needs a strike as he sends it in, and Griffey fouls this one off. Two balls and one strike to him. Griffey second in the National League and runs scored behind the man who is at first base right now, Pete Rose. Rose has tallied 80 runs, and Griffey has crossed the plate a total of 70 times. Quite a one-two combination when you have him hitting first and second in your lineup. Here's a throw to first base, and Rose steps back. Morgan is on deck. Home half of the first inning from Riverfront, no score. The Mets were out one, two, three. Griffey with a fly ball hit into left center field. Milner and Mangual both going into the gap, and that ball is going to be caught by Pepe Mangual as he and Milner crisscross in deep left center field. Marty, you'd have to say that John Milner misplayed the ball. It was coming right back to him, and it appeared that John, well, I wouldn't think he lost it, but uh, I certainly think he misplayed it. He should have caught the ball, and uh, Mangual, I think, was really looking for him to catch it up into the last split second when he made a catch down around his knees. One away in the inning for Joe Morgan. 317 batting average for the red second baseman. 17 homers and third in the league in RBIs with 69. And that infield double play depth. Morgan checks his swing on a high and tight pitch. Ball one. And L.A. winning at 11-7-6. Winning pitcher in that game, Charlie Huff. The loser, Al Roboski. Reggie Smith had a couple of home runs, and Davey Lopes at his second in as many games in that series. 2-0 now on Morgan. Matt Lack, a somewhat deliberate worker. Rose bounces off the back. He gets a holding Joe Torrey. Morgan swings and fouls it straight back, and it's two balls and one strike on him. This is the sixth full season for Matt Lack with the Mets. He came up for seven games in 1971 and has been with them full time since the 72 season. Never failed to win less than 10 games. Swing and a foul to the screen, two and two. Rung up records of 15 and 10, 14 and 16, 13 and 15, and 16 and 12. And a lot of people still are of the opinion that John Matlack has really not yet reached his full potential, and that is running off big winning seasons consecutively. Certainly have to feel he's got a good shot at having his big year win-wise this season. Morgan grounds one to Torrey. Torrey deals to Harrelson. Harrelson's return throw, and not in time with Matlack covering to get the double play on Joe Morgan. They force Rose 3-6 at second base. And the inning continues for left fielder George Foster. Foster had two of the five Cincinnati hits last night. In fact, he and Pete had four of them. Foster with a couple of singles. Rose, in addition to the home run, also had a single. George batting 325. With two out, Joe Morgan at first base in the bottom of the first inning. 
We'll be off tomorrow, and then we'll be on to Atlanta Friday morning. Single game there Friday night. Twin Bill on Saturday and a Sunday night game. Santo Alcala will pitch the series opener Friday night for the Reds against knuckleballer Phil Necro, Don Gullett, Pat Zachary Saturday against Andy Messersmith and Frank LaCorte. And Sunday, Gary Nolan will go against Dick Rufin. Morgan, a big lead at first base, and Matt Lack throws that way. Well, Matt Lack staring intently into Grody, but Foster out of the batter's box, and see what Morgan will do here with two down. Comes set, and again he works to first base, and again Joe hustles quickly back to the bag. George with those 74 RBIs, needing only four more to match his major league high of 78 of last year. There goes Morgan. The pitch taken. The throw down to second base. Not nearly in time. It glances oh, off of the Yards glove. Goes into shallow right center. And now Morgan gets a hole sign as he rounds third base. Well, we almost had a shot at getting him in. A stolen base for Joe Morgan. His 26th of the year and a throwing error against Jerry Grody on a ball that hit off of Mian's glove and kicked out into shallow right center. And for a moment there, it looked as if Morgan might have gotten the green light to come home, but Vail recovered quickly. Oh, that's uh, the thing. Vail uh, getting in there and moving with the play. Uh, he was uh, moving toward the infield as Joe broke and the throw was uh, released by Grody. Had he not, Joe definitely had a chance. And... Uh, Bale hustling and saved a run, possibly. The pitch was a ball to Foster. Morgan now at third base with two out, and George takes one that bounces up there, but Grody knocks it down out in front of the plate. Ball two. Rose began it with an infield hit to shortstop. Griffey fly it out. Morgan hit into a force play, and Joe has stolen second and has come on to third on Grody's throwing error. Black with a look in. Very slow come down to the belt and the pitch. Swung on and popped out of play to the right. Two and one to George Foster. And 40,000, almost 41,000 people here last night to see the pitching duel. Got a good crowd on hand again tonight. The Reds trying to get Morgan in in the first inning from third base. Matlack sends it in, and Foster takes a strike. It's two balls and two strikes to him. This is the final time for the Mets in Cincinnati in 76. We still have one trip remaining into New York to play him, and that'll be coming up on the long road trip the first part of the month of August. Swing and a miss. Foster strikes out swinging, and the side retired. The Reds, no runs, one hit, one error with one left. And after one complete, the Reds and the Mets, no score. Tonight's game closes out the current homestand for the Reds. The club will be back at Riverfront Monday night for a big week of baseball. First, it's three night games with the Giants, then the Padres visit. A night game next Thursday, a twilight doubleheader on Friday. Shrine night will be Saturday and George Foster poster day on Sunday. Plan to be on hand for all the fun and excitement and be sure to purchase your tickets in advance. Two, three, and four for the Reds. Bottom of the inning against Matlack. Ken Griffey, who fly to center in the first inning, leads it off. Griffey takes a pitch up a ball. Only three hit total in the game. The Reds have had two. An infield hit in the first by Rose. A second inning single by Concepcion. Foul ball will be back onto the screen, back of the plate. One ball and one strike. Not like has not walked anybody and had, has had at least one strikeout in every inning. He totals four right now. 1-1 one, one the count on Griffey with Morgan on deck and then George Foster. Each club has had a runner at third base, but so far no score. Up high, two balls and a strike. Reds 57 wins and 35 losses, 10 and 6 here in the month of July. Griffey with a foul ball on a high fastball, 2 and 2. 
While the New York Mets are 49 and 46, they're 14 back of Philadelphia, who chalked up an earlier win today. And three and a half games behind second place Pittsburgh, who has also won. They defeated Houston in the first of that twin bill by a final score of five to one as Jerry Royce won his tenth game. Matt Lack ready with a 2-2 pitch to Griffey, and here it is. Ground ball by the mound, base hit in the center field. Well, that might be an indication of good things to come in this fourth inning as Griffey opens up with a hard ground ball single to center. Joe Morgan is 0 for 1. He reached on a fielder's choice in the first inning. Then picked up a stolen base and advanced to third on the same play when Grody's throw went off of Mayan's glove into the outfield. Oh, we'll have to see if Griffey's going to be running. Matt Lack. There goes Griffey. Pitch is taken, a strike, and Grody cannot get the ball out of his glove. Well, the second stolen base of the night for the Reds as Griffey comes up with his 23rd, and I'll tell you, as good a pitcher as Matt Lack is, the one thing you can do on him, if you have any speed at all, is run, because he's very slow coming to the plate. Got that big high kick with the right leg, and already the Reds have burned him twice in the game. Morgan in the first, and now Griffey leading off the fourth inning. They got a runner at second base with nobody out. Morgan line drive, base hit right field. Here comes Griffey. He rounds third as the ball gets away from Bale. Morgan goes to second, and we lead. one nothing. The speed of Ken Griffey set up the run as he stole second and comes in on a single to right field. There's going to be an error charge to Mike Vale and credit Joe Morgan with his 70th RBI of the year. Now George Foster with a run in. Morgan at second base on the error by Vale and nobody out. Foster struck out in the first. And the on sneaking in behind the second base bag, and Foster jumps away from the pitch. A slider low and inside. Well, Joe Morgan banging in his 70th run of the year, and Foster has a chance to get his 75th with a hit. Off-speed pitch for a strike, and Foster, who very rarely conjures up an argument with a plate umpire, that time turned around and took a look at Dick Stello and simply shook his head. One ball and one strike. The Reds have broken the scoreless tie in the fourth inning and have a chance to get another one. Matt Lack, a look to second base and out of the plate. Low and inside, ball two, two and one. Atlanta, Montreal, nothing, nothing in the second inning. That is the only other game besides ours here that is going on in the National League tonight. And of course, Houston and Pittsburgh still with a second game to play in their twin bill. Foul ball, off speed pitch, had him out in front. It's two balls, two strikes. Not like mopping his brow on a warm, humid night in Cincinnati. We had a bunch of rain late this afternoon, but it let up and we're able to get the game underway on time. Two and two, a run in. Morgan leading at second base. Now, Mian straddling the second base bag, and now here's a foul ball down the right field line and into the seats. not homered against the Mets this season and right now would be a good time to get his first. Matt Lack has a propensity for giving up the long ball. He leads the Met pitching staff with 12. The 2-2 delivery again. Struck him out swinging for the second straight time. We'll pause for station identification on the Cincinnati Reds Baseball Network. 
Radio 7, WLW, Cincinnati. Those big halls call for big power, yet economical operation. Go with International. Their diesel-powered trucks are designed to save you money at your International dealer. John Matlack has just picked up his fifth strikeout as Foster goes down swinging, and now Johnny Bench, who was thrown out by the Met pitcher as a leadoff batter in the second. Here's a pitch to the plate. There goes Morgan to third, and no throw by Grody as Joe gets his second steal of the game. Oh, all we need now is a fly ball at the least to get Morgan in as Joe has stolen third, his 27th steal, and his second tonight. That's infield. Now comes in. Madlack studies the sign from Grody. The stretch and the pitch. Swing and a miss. Well, tonight in Montreal, and boy, this is big news. Cincinnati's Gary Hall has captured a gold medal in the Olympics, winning the 100-meter butterfly. That is great, great news. Not a chance to meet Gary Hall this past winter, and you talk about a dedicated athlete boy here's a line drive hit to left it's going to be foul one ball and two strikes on Johnny Bench one to nothing Cincinnati as we bat in the fourth inning we've got a potential second run 90 feet away and Joe Morgan Matlack, certainly viewing this one as a mighty, mighty big out if he can get bench. And he got him with a strikeout swinging on an off-speed pitch that had John way out in front. Well, Matlack continues to roll up the strikeouts. That's number six. As he gets Foster and bench back-to-back -back and facing Tony Perez as the Mets infield now drops back to normal depth. Tony struck out swinging in the second. The pitch. Blowing inside. Madlack checking Morgan over his right shoulder at third base. Tony takes his pitch high, ball two. Well, Joe said that over the leg problem, he's going to be running and running often in the second half of the season, and he's already stolen two in this one. Madlack behind and needing a strike at the expense of Perez. Tony ground one over third base. There's Steger. He's got the long throw, and it's in time to get Tony and end the inning. The Reds get one run, however, on a couple of hits, one Matt era, and one man left on. And at the end of four, it's Cincinnati one and New York nothing. Do you know everything we should be? A family place to eat. A morning meal, a late night treat. Say, how about next time out? Fresh as sunrise, it pours like sunshine, refreshing as morning, 
Participating dealers. Well, a good scoreboard stopper tonight. The question, the last National League relief pitcher to fan six consecutive batters. And you might have guessed for the rest of your life and not come up with the answer to that one. Don Gullett, who struck out six straight New York Met hitters in the second game of a doubleheader on the 23rd of August back in 1970. Concepcion is one for one. He's single to right off Matt Lack in the second inning. Ground ball will be foul at third base. The Reds have scored the only run. Griffey opened the fourth inning with a single, stole second, and came in on Morgan's base hit. Joe went to second on the era by Vale, then stole third. Foster bench strikeouts. Perez a ground ball to third. Matlock got tough to leave that potential second run at third base. One ball, one strike. That is a check swing. Slowly hit ground ball to third. Stager up with the ball. Quick throw to first base. Not in time. Stager made a good play on the ball. But Davey beat the throw for an infield hit number five of the game for Cincinnati. Marty, that was a fine play by John Stager. And uh, he got an awful lot on the ball. A good throw, I don't know. It been very close. Davey two for two. Here's Geronimo, who Matlack struck out in the third inning. Interesting, both Matlack and Seaver, the two foremost hammers in this Met rotation, both with losing records against Cincinnati Lifetime. Matlack is only three and eight. High throw to first base. Torrey has it, and David's back. Reds have had hits in every inning with the exception of number three. Now Matlack with a step off the pitching rubber. Matlack delivers. Swing and a miss. Well, we got some incorrect information from Montreal. Gary Hall won the bronze medal, not the gold medal, in the 100-meter butterfly. And a sweep for the United States. They went one, two, three, with Hall of Cincinnati getting the bronze medal. Still a good effort. Here's a throw to first again. A strike on Geronimo. Not like throwing to first. Concepcion has stolen 12 times in 16 attempts. Got to figure he's going to be going sooner or later. Geronimo takes it in on him for a ball, one and one. In the American League in the seventh inning, Chicago behind rookie Chris Knapp leads the Tigers four to one. California, Cleveland, nothing, nothing in the third. Throw to first. Oakland. And the New York Yankees, it's one nothing after a half inning of play at Yankee Stadium. Milwaukee, Kansas City, Boston, Minnesota, and Baltimore, Texas. Here's a foul ball to the screen. Well, we're going to say not yet underway, but Milwaukee leading Kansas City 2 nothing after an inning and a half. And the Oriole Ranger game about to start. Dave Pagan for Baltimore and Burt Blylevin for the Rangers. Chicago has defeated Detroit 4-1, to Nap the winner with a four-hitter, and Rule took the loss for the Tigers. Well, Matt Lack paying a lot of attention to Concepcion. He has Geronimo down, a ball and two strikes. Nobody out in the home fifth inning and one nothing Reds to score. 
Madlock steps off the pitching rubber again. Now the left-hander with a sign. The pitch. Pass ball high, two and two, and he had Davy going back to the bag as he made the kick and the pitch to the plate. Two-two pitch. Swung on and lashed it by Harrelson in the left field for a hit. Soft line drive. Base hit left field for Cesar Geronimo, and it'll be Freddie Norman up there in a definite sacrificing situation with two on and none out. Norman, after chopping one along the third baseline in the third inning, that just went foul, ended up striking out. And now we're going to get somebody up working in the New York Met bullpen for the first time tonight. Going to be right-hander Bob Apodaca. Torrey is in at first. Dager likewise at third. Norman Bunch, third baseline foul. And Davey opened the inning with an infield hit to third base, and Geronimo has gone the other way with a single to left. The Reds are trying to stir something up in inning number five with two on, nobody out, and already a one-nothing lead. Here's a pitch. Concepcion breaks for third. Here's a butt back to the mound. Madlack throws on to Mian covering at first base, and Davey was running full board at third base when Madlack came to the plate with a pitch. Credit Norman with a 1-4 sacrifice and bring to the plate leadoff batter Pete Rose. Rose has had an infield hit. He has been thrown out by Mian and once again we've got a red batter up there against a drawn in Mets infield and before Rose looks at Matlack, Grody's going to go to the mound. Brief meeting it is as Grody comes on back to the plate. So two in scoring position, Concepcion at third, Geronimo at second. Let's see what transpires here as Matlack finishes rubbing up the baseball and in checking in with Jerry Grody, he wants to look at it again. Here comes a pitch to Pete. Swung on and hammered to right field. That's going to be caught by Vail. Here's a tag by Concepcion. Here comes a throw to the plate. Well off the low mark. David is in to make it two to nothing. Brody going off to the right and well off to the right of home plate to take Mike Vail's throw on Rose's line drive. Sacrifice fly to right field. Geronimo holds it second as the score mounts to two to nothing. And here is Ken Griffey. One for two with a run score. Pete getting his 41st run batted in. Griffey swings, ground ball to first base. There's Torrey throwing to Matlack, covering, and they just got the out at first. And that ends the inning. One run, two hits, one left. Through five, the Reds over the Mets, two to nothing. What's good and cold and loved all over? Stroh's 12 can stay cold pack. Because it's made to get 12 cans of Stroh's beer cold and to help keep them good and cold until you need them. And it's a neat package to have around. The cans are easy to get to. They roll right out when you need them. And you can dispose of the empties just by putting them back in the pack. For a party or picnic or any occasion where beer lovers gather, put a few Stroh's stay cold packs around. 
beer stays cold and smooth and mellow. And it's right there at your fingertips when you're thirsting for a cool, fresh-tasting beer. So roll out the beer in Stowe's easy-to-carry compact stay-cold 12-pack. From one beer lover to another Stowe's beer. From one beer lover to another Stowe's. The Stowe Brewery Company, Detroit, Michigan. Flash of a paddle wheel on water and the echoing cry of a ship's whistle were sounds that you would find in almost any large river a century ago. Some ships carried high stacks of cargo bound for ports. Others hosted fashionable men and women enjoying the good life in this day of the floating palace. At the Ohio River Museum, those yesterdays are still alive. You can tour a real stern wheeler and a river flatboat, wander through exhibits of steamboat and river memorabilia, and watch a colorful multimedia show. The Ohio River Museum is waiting for you on Front Street in Marietta. Ohio's yesterdays are waiting for you, waiting for you to see. An adventure story that's real and true, and it all belongs to you. A bicentennial message from the Marathon Oil Company. They go to the top of the seventh inning. Freddie Norman leading it three to nothing as he has fired one hit baseball at the match to the first six. We'll be facing Felix Mian to begin this one and back to call the action for you. Here's Joe. All right, Marty. Mian has been to the plate twice in the game. Grounded to short. He's grounded to second. Freddie has allowed just one hit through six innings, that being a triple off the bat of John Miller in the fourth inning with two out. Norman has allowed just... Three balls to be hit out of the infield, a fly ball off the bat of Torrey in the second inning, and then Steger and Harrelson in the third inning. Since then, uh, nothing has left the infield. All right, Mian steps in a 259 batting average. Norman into the wind and delivers to Felix Mian outside the ball. Reds leading it three to nothing. Going a run in each the fourth, fifth, and sixth innings off John Matlack. Norman the 1 0. That swung on and hit to left field. And there is George Foster waiting and makes the catch. One away, and here's John Milner. Milner was called out on strikes in the first, triple to right in the fourth. Reds have out hit the Mets seven to one. New York with a couple of errors that did help the Reds in their scoring. Norman delivers. It swung on and bounced over the Cincinnati dugout and strikes a fan and back into the Reds dugout. West Coast this afternoon, the Phillies beat the Padres five to one. Jim caught the winner. He's 10 and 5 now for Philadelphia. Free slave and the loser. 6 and 7. Milner grounds one to Morgan. Hustling the bag is Perez. Joe's throw gets him by a step and quickly two away. Freddie has now retired 9 straight. He had retired 11 straight until Milner's hit in the fourth inning. Norman has had a three-ball count on just two batters. Joe Torrey to the plate. Joe 0 for 2, a fly ball to right, and he lined to Rose in the fourth. Norman delivers. Torrey takes a fastball high. Freddie looking for his eighth win of the year. He's back to the plate. That swung on and popped into shallow center. Going out, Morgan coming on, Geronimo. Morgan calls and makes the catch, and that's it. Ten straight for Freddie Norman. They side out in order, and it's the middle of the seventh. The Reds three, the New York Mets nothing. I'm Conway Twitty, and I'd like to tell you something. Change like the hot corn bread that you might.
Detroit, Michigan. Now the Reds lead it three to nothing as they bat in the bottom half, bidding number seven, Geronimo, Norman, and Rose to face reliever Bob Apodaca. Apodaca came into the game in the sixth inning with two out and a count, one ball, two strikes to Dave Concepcion and struck him out. Jack Bellingham getting in some throwing down to the Cincinnati bullpen. Geronimo, one for two, struck out in the third, single to left in the fifth. Apodaca to the plate, high and outside with a fastball. Ten innings, the Dodgers beat the Cardinals this afternoon at Dodger Stadium, seven to six. Giants over the Cubs, two to one. 1-0 1-0 to Geronimo inside. Two balls, no strikes. The Cubs had scored a run in the top of the ninth inning at Candlestick. The Giants came back with two in the bottom of the ninth to win it. 2-0 delivery. Geronimo looks at it down low, and it's three balls, no strikes. John Madlock worked five and two-thirds innings, allowing seven hits, striking out six, walked one, three runs, all three of them earned runs. Apodaca is in with a strike. Count three and one now to Geronimo. Back to the plate, Apodaca. That swung on a very high pop to left field. John Milner moving toward the line now there and waiting and makes the catch for out number one. One down, Freddie Norman to the plate, and boy, he's pitched a fine baseball game tonight. Freddie, 0 for 1, struck out in the third and put down a sacrifice bunt in the fifth when the Reds got their second run of the ball game. Norman, a switch hitter, he's hitting left-handed against the right-hander Bob Apodaca. Now wind the pitch. Norman swings and winds it to left field, a base hit. Bud Harrelson almost got to it. The Norman gets a base hit for Freddie. That is his fifth hit of the season. Hit number one off Apodaca and number eight for the Reds off New York pitching. Norman at first base with one away and Pete Rose steps in. Rose, one for two, had an infield single in the first and he grounded the second in the third and a sacrifice fly in the fifth. Pete's 41st RBI of the year. This is his first time hitting left-handed. Apodaca delivers, it's bounced back to the mound to Harrelson one. To Torrey, a double play. The play going one to six to three. And for the Reds, that's the 64th double play they've hit into this year. In the inning for Cincinnati, no runs, a hit, no errors. Nobody left on base. And at the end of seven, the Reds three, the Mets nothing. Do you know everything long been an American tradition. And at Frisch's, they serve you apple pie that's orchard fresh and baked with homemade flavor. So stop in at your nearby Frisch's and have a piece of delicious apple pie. seven and a half innings. It remains a Reds three and the Mets nothing. Nancy Wilson encores for Strohs. Oh, but it's lovely the way you make me feel like I'm Thank you. Give me the strength to 
find a special kind of peace of mind making me feel like I want it. Friendship is a sweet part of living. I know it when you're near me this way. Enjoying the show with the great taste of love. It makes Nancy Wilson for the Stroh Brewery Company, Detroit, Michigan. Family brewers for more than 200 years. Before Ken Griffey leads off the home half of the eighth inning, we'll pause for station identification on the Cincinnati Reds Baseball Network. It's JFPO mornings on WRW Cincinnati. George Foster Poster Day is Sunday, August 1st at Riverfront Stadium. The Reds meet the Padres. Every fan through age 21 gets a free souvenir color poster of the Reds' all-star left fielder. If you're a big souvenir buff, then you want to be at Riverfront on Sunday, August 1st. That's George Foster Poster Day. The Reds meet the Padres in a 2:15 game. And every fan 21 and under will get a free 2-foot by 3-foot poster, full-color action poster of the popular Reds left fielder. Make plans now and get your tickets in advance. That's the Reds and the Padres on Sunday, August 1st. Poster day featuring George Foster. Griffey has had one of our eight hits. A single in the fourth inning, he scored a run, and he'll be facing a third Met pitcher of the night and right-hander Ken Sanders. A win and a loss, a microscopic 161 ERA and making his 21st appearance. Right-hander sends in the pitch to Griffey. And Kenny takes it wide of the plate for a ball. Strike to him, one and one. In that second game of the twin bill in Pittsburgh in the fourth inning, Pirates two and the Astros nothing. Griffey looks at ball two with a strike. Whereas Billingham and McEnany have been throwing, it is now Raleigh Eastwick loosening up. Here's a 2-1 pitch to Griffey, and that is swung on and grounded to the right side and by the diving Felix Mion. <laughs> Kenny Griffey on with his second hit as he begins the eighth inning. Number nine for the Reds collectively, and Joe Morgan will be looking for his third. Joe reached on a fielder's choice in the first inning, but since then is single to pick up his 70th RBI and double in the sixth inning to lead it off. He scored in that frame and has stolen three bases tonight. A fine all-around game for Morgan. We've out hit him nine to three and outscored him three to nothing. Right-hander Sanders comes set and delivers. Joe bluffs a bunt and takes a pitch high. Griffey drawing a throw from Sanders to first base. Griffey has himself stolen a base in the game. He has swiped a total of 23. Another throw that way. While Morgan's trio gives him 28 on the year. Infield for the Mets looking for the bouncing ball. Sanders a quick throw to first base. One and nothing to count on Morgan with Foster on deck. Here's a pitch. Swung on and grounded foul at first base as Joe goes down in the sitting position. Ball and a strike. Joe has jumped his batting average some four points from its 317 mark at the beginning of the game. And with the RBI tonight, he's only four away from league leader and teammate George Foster. Sanders, a slow worker, looking into Grody. 
One one pitch. Low and inside. Two balls and a strike. Now Doug Flynn has gone down to get loose. Throw to first again. And probably see Flynn go into play second base in the Met ninth inning. Morgan ahead on the count. Sanders works to first. Padaka went an inning and a third, allowed the Reds a hit, struck out a batter, no run scored against him. All three coming off starter John Matlack. There's a foul at the plate. Two balls, two strikes. Morgan having a hard time down there right now. Swung at a ball and fell down and just bounced this one off of his leg. He calls time with plate umpire Dick Stello and now walking back over to the Reds' dugout. Trainer Larry Starr is there in the event that Joe needs him, but apparently not. He's just over to rub up the bat handle with a pine tar rag and now coming on back to home plate. Sanders, two balls, two strikes, nobody out. Griffey at first base and three to nothing Reds in the eighth inning. Morgan takes it off the plate outside, ball three and a full count. The right-hander comes set. The pitch, swung on, fly ball, hit to left center field. Mangua, long run as well as Milner, and Milner makes a running catch in left center field. John Milner playing it in left center field to retire Morgan as Griffey comes quickly back into the first base bag. One away for George Foster. He struck out twice, and in the sixth inning, bounced out to Steger at third. Sanders throwing to first. Now to Foster, the pitch, down and outside, ball one. Thinking about the ninth inning, Freddie Norman has... Mangual, Mian, and Milner. There goes the runner. Here's a ground ball to short. It's off Bud Harrelson. He's not going to get anybody. Griffey was breaking on the pitch. Foster hit a routine ground ball to shortstop, and Harrelson coughed it up. That's going to be the third New York era. Well, Johnny Bench with two on and one away. 0 for 3 with a ground out, a strikeout, and a pop out. And Guam, Mian, and Milner are the three hitters standing between Norman and a shutout. But the Reds are trying to add some insurance runs in the eighth. Bench takes a pitch away. Ball one. They give John right center. Swung on and fouled at home plate. It's a ball and one strike. Well, Griffey, the lead runner at second, Foster on at first. A hit and an error get him there and sandwiched in between a fly ball off the bat of Joe Morgan. And Mian playing it with Griffey exactly as he has done with Morgan in the game, and that is at second base until the pitch goes to the plate. Bench a grounder foul. It bounces over to the New York dugout. Sanders with the advantage against the Cincinnati catcher at a ball and two strikes. In the sixth inning at Montreal, Atlanta with Dick Rufin blanking the Expos three to nothing. And Sanders taking a lot of time as he parades around the mound rubbing up the new baseball. 
Gets a toe hold on that pitching rubber and looks down to Grody. He checks Griffey at second. He delivers to bench. Swung on and a base hit into left center field. Here comes Griffey. Rounding third. The throw will go to third base. A run is home. It's four to nothing. Johnny Bench with a single into left center field to knock in his 47th run. With Foster going to second and holding there. Here's Tony Perez. Tony is 0 for 2 with a walk. He reached for the base on balls in the sixth inning off Matlack. He fouls it off the end of the bat and over the screen, back of the plate. We're going to get further activity in the New York Met bullpen in the person of right-hander Nino Espinosa. Perez a foul strike, 0-2. Cincinnati now with a 10-hit game. Perez is looking for his first as the New York outfield plays him deep and bunches him in the alleys. They give him both foul lines, but trying to cut down on the extra base hit in the gaps. Ground ball, third baseman Steger on to second. Beyond on to Torrey, double play, and that's the inning. The Reds with a run on two hits, a Matt Arab and a man left on. We move to the ninth inning. Cincinnati four, New York nothing. There's a feeling around. It's America's sound. Pepsi people are feeling free. Free to choose a new way. Free to stand up and say, you be you and I'll be me. Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company of Cincinnati is pleased to announce the Cincinnati Reds 1975 World Champions commemorative bottle free with the purchase of a six-bottle carton of 32-ounce Pepsi-Cola. For a limited time, when you purchase a six-bottle carton of 32-ounce Pepsi-Cola, you receive free a 16-ounce Cincinnati Reds 1975 World Champions commemorative bottle. Five-cent deposit required on each bottle. Join the Pepsi people. at participating dealers. We're in the top of the ninth inning. Freddie Norman, who has allowed the New York Mets only three hits and no runs through eight innings of pitching and was able to weather the storm in the real first real threat that the Mets have posed against him tonight. That came in the last inning. When they had hits for Mike Vale and Roy Steger with one away, he got Harrelson on a pop and then against pinch hitter Ed Cranepool, a line drive that Griffey caught in right field to retire the eighth for the Mets and kill off the threat. Top of the order for New York. Pepe Mangual, Felix Mian, and John Milner. This reminder, plan ahead. The Reds will be meeting the Dodgers in September here at Riverfront Stadium. Three big games, the 14th, 15th, and 16th of September. Purchase your tickets in advance. Norman completing his warm-ups. The throw goes down to Doug Flynn, who now has come on to take over at second base for Joe Morgan. And here's Mangual. Right-handed batting met leadoff batter has bounced out twice and popped out to first base. High and inside, ball one. That's low. Two balls and no strikes. Norman had a one hitter through seven. That was a fourth inning triple by Milner. He's allowed only three hits total in the game. He has three balls and no strikes on Mangual. A rare occasion where he's gone a three ball count to a Met batter in the game, maybe four times total. And there is strike one call.
And the on swing and the bat in the on deck circle. And Raleigh Eastwick continues to stay ready in the Cincinnati bullpen. Hopefully he will not be needed. We'd like to see Norman get it in here. A complete gamer. Strike two call. Well, Freddie throwing back-to-back -back bullseyes after getting down in a hurry to Mangual. Three and nothing. It's now full. And the payoff pitch is on the way to the plate. Here's a base hit left field. Pepe Mangual with a single to left off Norman's 3-2 pitch. As Pepe comes up with his first hit on the New York Met uniform. Neon is grounded a short has bounced out to second and has lofted a fly ball to Foster and left. 0 for 3. McEnany will join Eastwick. Norman pitches to me on. Ball 1. And Freddy getting a little bit upset with himself right now. He snatched that throwback from Johnny Bench out of the air. Rose even with a bag at third. Concepcion shading me on a step or two toward the second base bag. Plate umpire Dick Stello inspects the baseball, throws that one out of play, and sends out a new one to Norman. Mangua leading at first. Here's a pitch. That's high. Two balls and no strikes. The Reds with a 4 nothing ninth inning lead. That single runs in innings four, five, six, and eight. Strike on the outside corner, and Mian not exactly in agreement with that call. Two and one. Felix taking his time getting back in as John Milner waits in the on deck circle. Foul ball will be out of play. Comes back off to our right. It's two balls and two strikes. If the shutout is in fact realized, it'll be the tenth thrown by Reds pitchers this season. He jammed him with a pitch, and he fouls it back onto the screen. Felix Mian, always pesky at the plate, hanging tough with a holding two-ball, two-strike count. After Pepe Mangual began the ninth inning with a single to left field. Norman to the belt. He delivers. Here's a foul off and out of play back behind the Reds' dugout. 38,598. You've seen a... Fine, fine pitching performance by Fred Norman, but not over yet. Leading by four runs and a 2-2 count on the Met second baseman. Runner leading at first base. Here's a fly ball center field. That should be out number one, and it is. Here's the owner of one of the four New York hits, Milner, with a triple to right in the fourth inning. He had a low-line drive that Griffey tried to shoestring. Kenny had no chance at all to catch the ball. It, as things turned out, skipped beneath his glove, and Milner ended up at third. But Norman then got Torrey on a line out to third base to end the inning. Milner bends away from a high and tight pitch. Swung on and foul between the legs of plate umpire Dick Stello. One and one. On deck, Joe Torrey at first base, Pepe Mangual, one out. Norman taking quite a bit of time at this point in the game between pitches. He sends in the next one, and Milner swings and grounds it foul outside of the first base coaching box and bounding into the Cincinnati dugout. Oh, he has gained the advantage on Milner, a ball two strikes. 
New York with a loss will drop one full game further back of the division leading Philadelphia Phillies who were victorious this afternoon. Philadelphia beat San Diego behind Jim Cott. We put the Mets 15 games out. Strike three call. Boy, what a fine screwball right there. Ball broke out over the plate and Milner completely handcuffed. Could do nothing but watch Dick Stello fire that right hand in the air. Freddie has his fourth strikeout and his second at the expense of Milner. And now Joe Torre will try to keep the Mets alive in the ninth. Torrey has fly to right, line to third, and pop to second. Ball to him. Perez playing behind Mangual. They're not concerned about him right now, and that should do it. A high pop in shallow right center. Flynn back. He's waiting, and this one belongs to the ref. In the ninth inning, the Mets no runs and a hit. Freddie Norman with a masterful four-hit shutout. As the Reds reign supreme tonight, 4 nothing, and gain a split in the two-game series. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a moment. Many American beers trace their roots back to Germany. More specifically, to a family that came from Germany in the 19th century and started their own brewery. Now, at first, they were very much a family affair. There was someone in the brewery every day seeing to it that the quality remained high. And that's how those traditions of care in brewing came to be. But today, you'll find most breweries are no longer owned by these original families. And the family tradition of care is fast disappearing. Well, let us tell you about one family that still works in their brewery every day. It's the Stroh family, and they take as much care in brewing Stroh's beer for the beer lovers of this generation as they did 200 years ago. Stroh's beer. There's still a family tradition behind it. One beer lover to another Stroh. The Stroh Brewery Company, Detroit, Michigan. Family brewers for more than 200 years. Well, we saw an outstanding pitching performance by a left-hander from New York last night, Jerry Kuzman, as he beat the Reds 2-1. to one. And tonight, we saw a man in the red and white double knit of the Cincinnati Reds go Kuzman one better. Freddie Norman with his third shutout of the year, picking up his eighth victory as he blanked the New York Mets on four hits in a 4 to nothing final. The Reds got single runs off John Matlack in the fourth, fifth, and sixth innings before manager Joe Frazier saw fit to take Matlack out in favor of Bob Apodaca. The Reds added their final run, an unearned run in the eighth inning, off the third New York pitcher of the evening, right-hander Ken Sanders. Four runs, ten hits, no errors with five left on, the winning Cincinnati numbers, while the Mets had no runs on four hits, three errors and four left on. Norman wins his eighth game of the year, picks up his third shutout, and the tenth collectively for Cincinnati pitching in 76. While Matt Lack suffered the loss, his record goes to a still fine, ten wins and four defeats. The Reds split the two-game series and are now 58-35 and 35 on the year. An off day coming up tomorrow, and then on to Atlanta to take on the Braves in the beginning of a four-game series on Friday night. We'll tell you about the starting pitchers in that one when we continue in just a moment. His children probably go to school with your children. His wife is from the town just down the road. Stadium for the first of four against Dave Bristol's Western Division Braves and Santo Alcala will get a crack at becoming the winningest pitcher on the Cincinnati staff. He will be shooting for his ninth win of the year against veteran knuckleballer and right-hander for the Braves, Phil Necro, who has won ten and lost five. 
That'll be a single game on Friday night, a twin bill on Saturday night, and a Sunday night game to wrap up the four-game series before the Reds return home to take on the San Francisco Giants in the first game of a week-long road trip, uh, homestand, rather, that will get underway here on Monday evening. Tomorrow night we'll be on the air with the pregame shows Friday night on most of these same stations beginning at 7.05 Cincinnati time. This broadcast is authorized under broadcasting rights granted by Cincinnati Reds Incorporated solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. Any publication, rebroadcast, or other use of the descriptions and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Cincinnati Reds Incorporated is prohibited. And now on most of these same stations, stay tuned for Joe Nuxall with the star of the game show. And again, the final score, the Reds 4, the New York Mets nothing. You've just heard another Cincinnati Reds on radio presentation with Marty Brenneman and Joe Nuxall. Reds baseball has been brought to you by the Stroll Brewery Company, family brewers for more than 200 years. And by Marathon Oil Company, people who make their living doing the best they can. By the Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company of Cincinnati, bottlers of Pepsi-Cola, Dr. Pepper, and Schweppes products. By Frisch's, at breakfast time, lunch time, or any time you're hungry, there's always a Frisch's nearby. By the First National Bank of Cincinnati, a good place to put your money and your confidence. And by Riverside Ford in Newport, a block and a bridge from downtown Cincinnati. Follow the world champion Cincinnati Reds and tune in next time for the Reds on radio on this, the Cincinnati Reds Baseball Network. Win a night out with the Reds from Cincinnati Cooperative Milk Sales. Send your name and address to Milk is Much More Contest, 1889 Central Parkway, Cincinnati, Ohio. WLW Cincinnati. Now, star of the game with Joe Nuxall, brought to you by Gabriel Shock Absorbers. No matter what you drive, no matter how you drive, there's a Gabriel Shock for you. Gabriel, king of the road. We're back in the dugout here at Riverfront Stadium where the Reds have beaten the New York Mets tonight behind Freddie Norman by a score of 4 to nothing. Fred getting his fourth shutout of the year, his eighth win, his fifth complete game, and what a job he did, allowing the Mets just four hits. Striking out four, did not walk a batter. And our star of the game, Freddie Norman. We'll be back with Freddie after this word. Hello, this is Roger Miller with a money-saving solution to what could be a serious problem. Chances are pretty darn good that the shocks on your car are pretty darn bad. You see, shocks wear slowly. You're not used to wear the problem. So you have to make that sudden turn, quick stop, or jarring ride over a rough stretch of road. So here's the money-saving solution. The heavy-duty shock sale at your Gabriel Shock Absorber dealer. Now's the time to save on Gabriel's new low-priced heavy-duty shock, the Roadstar. Or for more control when the going gets rough, save on Red Riders, Gabriel's premium heavy-duty shock. Either one of them will give you a real bonus in driving safety and comfort. So don't wait. Check out the heavy-duty shock sale now at your participating Gabriel dealer. King of the road. Get your Gabriel shocks at CNC Auto Parts, 129 North Main Street, Miamisburg, Ohio, or Camco Auto Parts, Alexandria, Kentucky. Freddie Norman, our star of the game tonight, and Freddie, as we said, getting his eighth win of the year, his fourth shutout, and uh, well, uh, this uh, well, we keep telling you this, Fred, and we're very happy to tell you. A fine and well-pitched ball game. Well, Joe, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show, too. I don't know. I, I guess uh, I had a little more incentive tonight. I, I was going for uh, my number uh, 30th career uh, win here at Riverfront. I, I got it, and uh, at least I got 30 wins before uh, Randy Jones did. Huh? It only <laughs> took me four years. Freddie, tonight, a lot of ground balls. Uh, not really customary to your pitching, is it? Well, no, not really. I get a lot of fly balls, Joe, uh, because of the screw bond. I think they try to reach out and get it. But uh, tonight I had a good fastball, and I was throwing it pretty much down uh, around the knee area and, uh, and st uh, away. And I think they were just kind of hitting it right in the ground, and my sliders on occasion were down, and that makes them hit them right in the ground. I'd like to have that pretty consistent all the time, but sometimes you can't, and hopefully when you don't have it, you get it in a better spot. Freddie, did you feel like you had this kind of game in you tonight warming up? I sure did, Joe. I, as soon as I warmed up, uh, well, it's this type of night. It's very humid out, and uh, when, I, I, when I feel like this, you know, when it's humid, your fingers just feel good. The ball feels good to you. The whole shot. And I had a little problem with my arm last week, and uh, and it really felt good. And of course, tonight was the type of night that you know you'd like to be able to throw. And 
and uh, just pretty much stayed loose all through the you know throughout the game. So uh, I had no problems physically. Any pitches consistently good for you tonight? Probably, uh, I would have to say the fastball. I really would. Uh, I had thrown some good sliders, but I would think the fastball. I didn't throw too many curveballs. The curveballs I did throw were very effective, so uh, you know, kept them honest anyway if I didn't have a real good screwball, which I didn't. But I thought my fastball was probably my best pitch tonight. Freddie, uh, I checked with Shep as he walked through the clubhouse uh, to find out how many pitches you made. 111 pitches, which is uh, really a good ball game. Yeah, it's not really all that bad, 111. Uh, I, normally, when I'm pitching pretty decent consistently, I usually throw about that, about 105 to 120, really, and uh, that's not really that much for me. You know, I, hopefully, I still have a lot of baseball throw, you know, throws left in me, but uh, it doesn't really bother me that much when I, you know, if I stay in that area. Fred, uh, no walks again tonight, and uh, your control really the last inning. Well, that's your uh, fifth victory in your last six outings, if I'm correct, maybe fourth and five, something. But uh, yet uh, your control has just been, uh, well, just magnificent. Well, Joe, it's, you know, uh, I know it, and so does uh, everybody that tells me that's the key to my success. You know, I've got to throw strikes. And and proved it, of course, again tonight. If I throw strikes, I'm going to get them out. If I challenge, I can, I'm able to challenge them because I have all these pitches. All I have to do is just throw them over the plate. And if it just sink into this little tiny head of mine, I'll be all right. Isn't that funny how difficult it is sometimes? It sure is. It's, it's amazing. Randy Darman, our star of the game tonight. We'll be back with more after this word. <laughs> this is the old left-hander for security moving and storage. You may know that the first World Series was played back in 1903. But do you know who the contending teams were? Well, I'll give you a hint. They were the same teams the Cincinnati Reds had to beat to win last year's series. That's right. The first World Series was played between the Red Sox and the Pirates. And the Red Sox won it. Well, a lot of things have changed since 1903. The Reds are now world's champions. 1903 was also the year Security Moving and Storage Company started in business. Since then, they have moved a lot of Reds fans. People moving up. People who wanted a smooth, dependable move. It's a thought to keep in mind. The next time you're rounding third and heading for a new home, call the Reds fans at Security Moving and Storage. Let Don Bullock or Ken Hamlin arrange a free estimate. Security Moving and Storage Company, agent for Allied Van Lines, Cincinnati's major league mover since 1903. Freddie Norman, our star of the game tonight, getting his eighth win of the year. And Fred, as uh, we look at the scorebook, uh, really not a real difficult inning for you. Maybe the one inning, uh, you would say, would be the eighth inning when uh, Vail uh, singled. And then after the strikeout at Grody, uh, Steger singled. And uh, at that particular time, a, a mild threat by the Met. Yeah, I think I uh, thought about it a little bit. Uh, I says, well, you know, here I am. I think I was three runs up at the time, wasn't I? And I think we got our fourth run in the bottom of the eighth, didn't we? I believe. Okay, so I know our three runs up. Now I got a little excited, I think, and uh, kind of lost my memory a little bit, you know, of saying, hey, wait a second, now you're going just the opposite way of you, the way you used to do. You used to get behind and all this stuff. Let's, you know, revert back and start off by throwing a strike. You're up three to nothing. You're not behind three to nothing. So uh, I just came right back and challenged again and uh, got out of it, hopefully. Yeah. The ball that, uh, the one ball in the inning that, had a mild scare to it was the one that uh, Crane pulled it. Yeah, he hit it real good. It was a slider. Got behind on him 2-0. Oh. I thought the second pitch I threw to him was a, was a slider. Just just missed. And uh, So I said, well, I, I'm going to have to throw this for a strike. Whatever I throw, a slider, curve, screw, ball, foul, well, whatever it's going to be, it's got to be a strike. And I kind of just laid the slider right in there. And uh, he hit it pretty good, but uh, it was in the alley. And, uh, of course, Grippy was playing him off the, the line, so he was able to get to it. But and pitching the right-handed batters, uh, these uh, the, the Mets, uh, most of them know you. Do you ever get concerned? Do you ever second-guess yourself on a pitch? I don't think so, Joe. The reason I don't because I, I try to keep them honest. I try to come inside more now because I really I feel. I can almost see them. As soon as they stand up to the plate, I can see them leaning. I can't. It's unbelievable how you do that. And uh, like maybe on a Don Guller, these guys, no, they're not leaning at all. See, so, you know, they're expecting, you know, basically basic fastball pitcher they're looking on me to be more outside consistently you know with the fastball and the screwball so i think uh, uh, what's kept me honest what's kept them honest with me is the fact that i'll throw that slider in on them they know it now so they'll kind of stand straight up a little more and this is what i want i'll try to establish that Freddie, is it kind of amazing to you and the years you've played baseball that uh, one pitch 
can really uh, make a tremendous difference in an individual? I really do, Joe. Uh, as you know, I used to be a fastball pitcher. I had a fastball, curveball, and straight change. All three pitches were good. And again, I come up with a sore arm, so now I've got to get something. I, you know, I, I don't have a good fastball, and uh, you know the curveball was very adequate. When you have a sore arm, you don't have much of anything, really. And uh, I fought that off for a year, and I came back pretty strong with it. I started throwing pretty good again, and uh, but I was a better pitcher and smarter pitcher. And uh, so what happens is uh, later on, I didn't come up with a slider until a few years ago. Uh, this, of course, the arm bit was in 68, so it's been a while. And all of a sudden, now I come up with a slider, and that's just, uh, it's been the whole effect of my, uh, I think, consistency now. It's been the slider. But in coming up with a slider, Fred, uh, would you say that it really uh, had, well, I say you had uh, not very good consistency with it until maybe the end of last year and this year? Probably so, because I hadn't. I I think I started throwing that in 70, middle of 72, like in July, and that pitch to me is just like the screwball. It takes a lot of work and effort to really work on it, and uh, so I think I'm just starting to really come around with it. When you think about the slider and starting off, was it a problem of, uh, of breaking too big or not enough? At first, it was breaking too big because I thought that you had to really. Uh, slurve it in other words and uh, Roger Craig of course uh, now with the, the Padres when I was there had taught me the slider what it's called basically really is a, uh, it's a cut uh, fastball and uh, what you do is you're concentrating as you're coming through fastball fastball until you get right out where your release point is and then you pull it down with your that in a middle finger and uh, this is what causes that little break about four to six inches and that's all you need and uh, it just looks like a fastball and then right at that last moment there it breaks into the guy and it jam him uh, very easily and this is what it's really, it's, if it breaks too much, it's almost like a curveball. It's really not that effective. How about the speed of it? The speed of it, I throw sometimes uh, harder than my fastball uh, on occasions. But uh, normally it's basically about like a fastball, really, with a, with a short uh, cut on it. All right, one, one more further thing, and uh, got to talk about it. I, I don't even have to ask you. Go ahead and answer the question without me answering. Oh, man, I had a shot, did I? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it was, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm glad Malak still went to the game because uh, I'd have been on the right side. Uh, as you know, I'm sure he wished there were nine Fred Normans in the line, I believe. But, uh, well, I, I was able to turn around, and I, I just hit the ball to left field. It was just right there and just got the bat on the ball. All right, Fred, uh, really, though, I'm talking about the bat uh, in the uh, fifth inning when the, we got our second run, uh, he did put on a, a good bunt. Well, the ball was right back at the pitcher, but uh, our guys were running, so it was okay there. Uh, the first pitch was, a, uh, I think it was a curveball. I don't think it was a slider. It was a curveball. It was down, and I just missed it. Uh, I bunted it, and it just went foul. Of course, on that left uh, left field side there, uh, it kind of tends to roll off, so you got to, you know, put it out just a little more towards the pitcher's mound, and... Uh, but uh, the second pitch, of course, was a fastball right there, and I just tried to bunt it fair and because uh, our guys were running. So I got them across. Yeah, and the uh, first time up, you almost had a base hit. I, uh, I don't know what kind of spin you had on that ball, but uh, it was three feet fair and then finally trickled foul. Yeah, that's that old swinging bunt, man. I, I almost had it. I, well, as I, I know as I walked back, I had to stop, you know, take a little breather. I, I was kind of really trotting out there. <laughs> Well, Freddie, we certainly congratulate you on your eighth win of the year, your fourth shutout, and a very well-pitched baseball game. Okay, Knox, thanks. All right. Freddie Darman, our star of the game tonight, Freddie with his eighth victory of the year, his fifth complete game, and his fourth shutout as the Reds beat the Mets 4 to nothing. That's it from here in the dugout, now on most of these same stations. Stay tuned for Marty Brenneman with scores and comments. Tomorrow on off day for the Reds, and we'll move on to Atlanta and open a four-game series with the Atlanta Braves at Atlanta Stadium. Until then, this is the old left-hander rounding third and heading for home. Good night, everyone. You've just heard Star of the Game with Joe Nuxall, brought to you by Admiral, Roper, and Speed Queen, leaders in home appliances and electronics. This is your roving real estate reporter with Dennis Ashcraft of the Northern Kentucky office of West Shell Realtors. But, Dennis, it's no longer one West Shell office in Northern Kentucky, is it? No. By September, we'll have three. And West Shell has only been on the Kentucky side about a year. That's right. A year ago in March, we opened our first office in Erlanger. And our business has grown so fast that we have to expand to meet the needs of our clients. So we've now opened our Highland office in Camel County. And in September, we'll open our Florence office in Boone County, close to the Florence Mall. I'm going to be the manager there. 
And I should feel right at home since I've lived within a mile of that office for many years. Well, it's the old West Shell story. You live where you work and you work where you live. That's why we always know the area. And because we're expanding, we're looking for additional experienced salespeople. So anyone listening who's interested, please give us a call. Two offices, soon to be three, in northern Kentucky. West Shell. Time now for scores and comments with Marty Brenneman. Brought to you in part by Quality Dodge East. Straight up Beachmont, two miles east of I-275, Cincinnati. Hello again, everybody. Back at Riverfront, where Freddie Norman defeats the New York Mets 4 to nothing tonight. A four-hit shutout for the Cincinnati left-hander, who picks up his eighth victory of the year and allows the Reds to gain a split in this two-game series at Riverfront Stadium. Checking out the American League, a final score in the first of that twin bill at Chicago. Rookie Chris Knapp doled out only four Tiger base hits as the Cubs defeated Detroit 4-1. Four, to four runs, 11 hits an error for Chicago. One run, four hits and one error for the Tigers. Knapp evens out his record at one win and one loss. And the defeat pinned on Tigers starter Vern Rule. He's won five and lost seven. In the second game, at the end of five and a half, the White Sox are trying to pick a pair. It's 3 nothing as the Sox came up with three runs in the fourth inning off Tigers starter Dave Lemanchik. Bart Johnson trying to square his record at 9-9 nine and nine for Chicago. The rest are partial scores through five and a half innings of play in Arlington, Texas. The Orioles and the Rangers are tied at two runs apiece. Reggie Jackson continues to play long ball for Baltimore. He had his 14th in the first inning with one on. That's Dave Pagan for the Orioles and Burke Blylevin pitching for the Texas Rangers. They're in the ninth inning at Cleveland with the Indians holding a 6-2 lead over California. And Nolan Ryan looks like he's going to get nailed with his 12th loss of the year. And Rick Waits is out to even his record out at four wins and four defeats. They're in the ninth inning at Yankee Stadium, New York, making mince meat out of the Oakland A's. Ten to one, that score. Uh, Thurman Munson is homered for the ninth time this season. A three-run blast in the fifth inning. And Catfish Hunter is three outs away from winning his 12th game of the season. Kansas City batting in the bottom of the seventh inning and trailing the Milwaukee Brewers and Bill Travers five to nothing. Travers, after his 11th victory, Fitzmorris started for Kansas City. Rounding out the American League schedule, Boston down to Minnesota five to one through five complete. Dave Gold seven and eight for the Twins and Rick Wise seven and seven for the Boston Red Sox. Once again, the one final American League score in the first game of the Chicago Twin Bill. The White Sox behind rookie Chris Knapp defeats the Detroit Tigers four to one. We'll be back to take a look at the National League in just a moment. If you're looking for a great buy on a little Japanese car, come to the Colt Carnival. Come see the Dodge Colt Carousel with road wheels, tinted glass, reclining bucket seats, adjustable steering column, and AM, FM radio all standard. Terrific gas mileage, 37 miles per gallon on the highway, 24 in the city in EPA estimates. That's with four-cylinder engine and five-speed transmission. Your actual mileage may vary. See your Dodge dealer for a great buy during the Colt Carnival. Two reclining bucket seats and carpeting for both your feet and windows made of tinted glass. A key for lock and up your gas. Outside air can flow right through with front disc brakes are standard too. How did Dodge Colt put so much in such a little car? Standard power brakes are new, metallic seats are new here too. This gold maroon and even blue, perhaps a five-speed stick for you. How did Dodge Colt put so much in such a little car? See your nearby Dodge dealer for his low price during the Colt Carnival. See Loveland Dodge in Loveland. During the commercial break, the two finals coming in from the American League. Cleveland defeating California 6-2, 6-9-1 for the Indians, 2-7-2 for the Angels. Waits wins it 4-4. Ryan loses it 7-12. And, and the Yankees besting Oakland 10-1 on a 15-hit New York attack, while Oakland had nine off of Catfish Hunter, who won his 12th game. And Mike Norris suffered the loss. He's 3-3. That game played before 26,451 at Yankee Stadium. Now to the National League. The Dodgers scored a run in the 10th inning this afternoon to defeat the St. Louis Cardinals on the coast. 7-6. 7-13-1 for L.A. 6-7-1 for the Cardinals. Charlie Huff won it in relief. 8-4. Al Raboski lost it in relief. 5-6. Three Dodger home runs highlighted the victory. Davey Lopes, who hit his first of the year last night off Lynn McLaughlin, had his second of the season today, leading off the bottom of the first inning. Reggie Smith had two Dodger home runs, his 12th and the third with none on, and his 13th and the fifth also with the bases empty. Philadelphia, with Jim Codd winning his 10th game, knocked off San Diego 5-1. Five, five runs, 11 hits, an error for the Phillies, a run, 7 hits, and no errors for the Padres. 
Got his 10 and 4. He had relief help from Gene Garber, who picked up his eighth save. And Dave Fry Slevin lost his fifth consecutive game. His record is now 6 and 7. That game played in the quick time of an hour and 58 minutes. One home run. Tommy Hutton at his first in the third with two mates aboard for Philadelphia. The San Francisco Giants saw Joe Wallace homer off John Montefusco in the top of the ninth inning at Candlestick Park for the first run of the game. And the Giants turn right around and score two in the bottom of the ninth to give Montefusco his ninth win of the year. Two runs, seven hits, no errors for the Giants. A run on only three hits and no errors for Chicago. Montefusco, nine wins and eight losses. And Suter lost it in relief for the Cubs. His record goes to one and two. Now tonight in the first game of the Three River Stadium doubleheader at Pittsburgh, the Pirates behind Jerry Royce defeated Houston and Larry Durker 5-1. to one. Five runs, nine hits, no errors for the Pirates. A run, nine hits, and one error for Houston. Royce thus becomes a 10-game winner. He's been beaten five times. Durker's record even at 9-9. Nine and nine. Bill Robinson had his 18th homer in the fourth inning with one on for Pittsburgh. In the second game, through six complete, the Pirates behind Larry Demery are shutting out Houston and Joaquin Andahar 3 to nothing. While in the ninth inning at Montreal, the Expos hold a 4-3 lead over the Atlanta Braves as Montreal tries to take its second straight from Dave Bristol's club. Don Stanhouse stands to win his seventh game, and Dick Rutman, the starting pitcher for the Atlanta Braves. Again, the National League Finals, Dodgers in 10, defeat St. Louis 7-6. Philadelphia, as Cott wins his 10th, best San Diego 5-1. San Francisco 2-1 over the Cubs, and Pittsburgh, with Jerry Royce becoming a 10-game winner, knocks off Houston in the first game 5-1. We'll be back to recap the Reds' win over the New York Mets tonight. That coming up in just a moment. Bought me one of them foreign cars, and my man Roger says, I'm really in trouble if the transmission ever goes. He said, who are you ever going to find to fix that car? And I said, Amco fixes foreign cars. And you know what he said? Nothing. You're going to be surprised, but don't be surprised by the nice little extras at Amco. When some transmission places see a foreign car pull up, they pull down the shades, but not Amco. The way they see it, every car has a transmission, and that's good enough. At Amco, no car is foreign to them. You're going to be surprised, but don't be surprised by the nice little extras at Amco. They service four million transmissions, and they do things right. And they do it on most foreign cars, too. Amco, double A, MCO. Amco Transmission Centers are located at 7353 Coleraine and at 3810 Glenway. Well, left-hander Freddie Norman was at his absolute best at Riverfront Stadium tonight as he fired off a four-hit shutout at the New York Mets. The Reds winning at 4 nothing. Norman, the third shutout that he can call solely his own this season. He also collaborated in one along with left-hander Will McEnany. It was Norman against Matlack, and you had to figure with both pitchers having their good stuff, it was going to be a pitcher's duel, and it was exactly that for three innings before the Reds broke the scoreless deadlock by scoring the first of their four runs in the fourth inning. Ken Griffey led off with a single to center field, stole second, and came home on Joe Morgan's single to right as Joe picked up his 70th RBI and the Reds led it 1-0. It was a 2-0 game in the fifth inning when Concepcion beat out a slow roller to third. Geronimo then followed with a base hit to left, and after Norman laid down the sacrifice, Rose had a line drive out to Mike Vale in right field with Concepcion scoring to make it 2-0 Cincinnati. In the sixth inning, there was a double to begin it by Morgan, who then stole third and came home on a John Matlack wild pitch. When Matlack later on in the inning issued another wild pitch, he was lifted in favor of Bob Apodaca. The Reds rounded out the scoring off right-hander Ken Sanders in the eighth on a Griffey single, a one-out error off the bat of George Foster, an error on a boot by shortstop Bud Harrelson, and a run-scoring single to left-center field by Johnny Bench as he picked up his 47th run batted in, and the Reds led it 4 to nothing. Norman had a one-hit shutout going to the eighth inning. That one hit was a fourth-inning triple by John Milner. And in the eighth inning, it was a single by Vale, a one-out single by Steger. But then the left-hander got tough as he retired Harrelson on a pop to Concepcion and got pinch hitter Ed Cranepool on a line drive to Ken Griffey in right field. In the ninth inning, there was a leadoff single by Pepe Mangual, but Mian fly to center. Milner looked at a third strike, and the game ended when Joe Torrey popped out to Doug Flynn at second base. The totals in the game, four runs, ten hits, no errors, and five left for Cincinnati. The Mets had no runs on four hits. They committed three errors afield and left four men on. 
Norman wins his eighth game in ten decisions, and Matlack started and lost it for the Mets. His record goes to 10-4, and four, and he is now career against the Reds. Three wins and nine losses. The Reds maintain their six-game edge over the L.A. Dodgers by virtue of the victory and once again go 23 over 500 with a record of 58 wins and 35 losses. Uh, an off date tomorrow, and then we'll be in Atlanta Stadium on Friday night for the first of that four-game weekend series. It'll be Santo Alcala, an eight-game winner for the Reds, and for the, Philadelphia, for the Atlanta Braves, it'll be knuckleballer and ten-game winner, Phil Necro. Once again, the final score tonight in a game that took two hours and 16 minutes to play before a crowd of 38,598. The Reds with Norman four, the New York Mets nothing. Until Friday night, for Joe Nuxall, this is Marty Brenneman saying so long, everybody. This has been Scores and Comments with Marty Brenneman. Brought to you by Amco Transmissions, number one in Reds country. The winning team is the team with a winning combination, a combination of dedication and talent, like our Reds. In sports reporting, the winning team is the Enquirer Sports Section, selected the best two years running by the Ohio Associated Press Writers Association. Get the facts from the best in the business every morning in the Enquirer Sports. Subscribe now. Call 651-4500. Follow your sports team with a winning team in sports in the Enquirer Sports Section. You've just heard another radio presentation of the world champion Cincinnati Reds. Be sure to join us again for both the game broadcast and our special pre- and post-game programs, all of which are produced solely by the broadcast department of the Cincinnati Reds Incorporated, Jim Winter's director.